Hi folks, I'm Imran and I'll be talking to you together with my teammates Alvin and Iman about how to do AI assisted feature selection in Spark. And be sure to give us feedback, we would love to hear from you. So I'm gonna walk you guys through the introduction. Why should you do feature selection? What are the current approaches and the limitations and how is our approach different? Then I'm gonna hand it over to Alvin who's gonna go into more details about our approach. And then lastly, we'll talk about our open source library that you can use to do this yourselves in Spark. First, something quick about Clarify Health. Uh, we process about 11 billion healthcare claims for 150 million patients. It's a little over 40 terabytes of data. We train hundreds and hundreds of models. Right now we're at 2000 models and they contain about 2000 features. Everything is built in AWS and Spark and you can, uh, uh, we, have, we can train five, within five hours, we can train uh, models for uh, you know, 84 million patients. So the AI assisted feature selection is part of our auto ML pipeline, or how I like to call it, how can new models be created while I'm sleeping? So we start out by acquiring the data, certainly. The next step is our AI assisted feature selection. So this is where we'll talk about today. We're able to automatically select which features should be included in the model. After the features are selected, then we go through a selection of the algorithm to use for training that model. And after that, we do a automated Bayesian hyperparameter tuning to find the appropriate hyperparameters for that model. And then next we do the training of the model. And then after that we've trained the model, we have a set of automated tests that run that are checking various things in the model and figuring out if the model is good or bad. If the model is bad, then it gets put into the rejected queue where the a data scientist will go in, take a look and figure out what went wrong. If the automated test passed, then the model is promoted to the model tracking. And then after that into the model explanation stage where we generate the explanation for the model. And we also generate the metadata for you to be able to do exploration. And then these models become available in our interactive UI that customers can use to uh, interact with the UI, see the predictions and play with the models. And our main goal here is no human involvement required unless there's a model is rejected and the data science needs to go look at it. Okay, so let's talk about um, are more features better or not? Um, so certainly there's a lot of uh, people who are still have models with you know, less than 20 features. If that's true, then this is probably not the talk for you. But if you're people who have more than 20 hundreds of features, then certainly less features is uh, maybe may better. So let's talk about some of the problems with more features. So first is that more features make the models hard to understand. So if you've ever looked at uh, coefficients for 2000 features or feature importance for 2000 features, you'll understand that. It also increases the training time. The more features you have, the longer it will take uh, Spark or anything to train the models. And then it introduces noise into the models. So as you have more features, the models is not able to find the optimal parameters. And you also increase the chance of having highly correlated features. So this can confuse the models return resulting in an, a suboptimally tuned model. And lastly, the more features can result in overfitting so your model is not able to generalize well. So it's uh, something I would say less is better in if you can figure out what the right set of features are to use. Okay, so what are the common current co approaches? Right? So the first approach people take is what I would call the, the domain knowledge approach. Right? So someone will say, well, I know that diabetes people do stay longer in the hospital. So as a result, we should not include diabetes as a feature. What we found in the past is really a lot of times our domain knowledge is not that good. Once we look at the data, we find that a lot of these um, domain knowledge that we hold is not actually correct. Second thing people try is they remove features one by one from the model. So you will remove a, a feature, see how the model performs and see if that feature was really um, useful in that model. That works if you have a few features, but when you have hundreds of thousands of features, the number of possible combinations is extremely large and there's just no way you can try that. The last approach people tend to try is just use all the features. I mean, we spend time building these features, let's just throw them all in and let the machine learning models figure this out. This also results in suboptimal models because the model training is not able to figure out everything. For example, the difference between one hot encoding and numerical encoding is really something a human figures out and says, do the numbers mean something or is it just unique values? 
This is also something I would call everything but the kitchen sink approach. So the ideal approach we've seen is that it's combining the human and the machine together. So this is what we call the AI assisted feature selection. So let's talk about what, when we, when we thought about this, we said, okay, what is it that this would need to do? So the first requirement was it had to be automated and had to intelligently select features. It wasn't a random selection of features. And it was also number two was it also had to scale. It had to handle thousands of features like we have and, and at least 50 million rows and 40 terabytes of data. And the last one is it, we also wanted the ability to preserve certain features that we always want. Customers might want to see age, even though it may not be the, the best feature for the model. So these were the main requirements. I'm now going to turn it over to Alvin, who's going to talk about how he and the other team built the, our approach to be able to address these. Uh, this is Alvin Hendrick, and thank you, Imran, for giving us such a nice overview uh, why we chose to use uh, this structured learning approach based on, and then we, our goal was to basically come up with an approach which Imran already described, right, uh, to basically get rid of thousands of features which we have and focus on the features which we really need to focus on. So we have a, we chose an approach called a structured learning approach, which is a filter-based approach, right? There are wrapper methods out there. Uh, tailored for very high sparsity, scalable and efficient suboptimal feature selection, right? An option to specify must include features. So we were looking for a solution which basically fits our needs uh, because of the needs which you see on the screen, right? Must include, include feature. We just don't want to get rid of all the features, right? So the steps we have is like quick ranking of all the feature importances, no model training needed. Then we do a linear search based on the ranked feature and then train an end cross validation step model to basically guess the best model of out of those features. So here's our approach it looks like. So you see on the bottom of the screen, the feature set, this is the whole feature set one to N. Right hand side, you have an outcome and label. And then we have the ranked feature on the left hand side, which is a yellow box. So the way we calculate is basically we calculate a similarity between the feature and the outcome label, which has the highest correlation. And once we find that highest correlated feature, we put it in the ranked bucket with a score in, in front of it. So you see that the feature K is now in the ranked feature bucket, right? Uh, because that is highly correlated with the label outcome, which we figured it out. The similarity uh, with the highest correlation. So this is how we move towards the next feature. So now we pick a feature underscore two, if you see on the bottom of your screen, right? That feature has should have a highest correlation to the outcome label, but it should have the minimum correlation with an existing feature, which are already in the ranking feature bucket, right? So we are going to penalizing using the formula, which you see it on the screen, right? Uh, is basically similarity of the feature, I with an outcome of label, and then taking the max of similarity of feature, I, in conjunction with the feature already in the ranked bucket, right? So we chose to max over average so that the scoring is independent from the number of features that are already selected, right? So all we are doing is we are taking the highest correlation with an outcome label and making this feature to deprioritize, right? Because there is another feature which already have a high correlation with an existing feature in the ranking bucket, right? So feature two gets there and it gets the rank number two, as you can see. So here's the algorithm I'll describe in a quick steps, right? So we rank feature based on their correlation with an output, select the feature with the highest correlation score as top rank and remove it from back of unranked feature, right? And ranking the remaining feature based on this formula, right? Feature equals absolute correlation of features outcome minus the max of the uh, feature with an already ranked feature in the bucket. So selecting the feature with the highest feature score as the next rank and removing it from the bag of features, right? We repeat this process until CND, until all the features are ranked in a ranked bucket, right? If there is a must include feature in the list, we put them on the top of the already ranked features list, right? Because we want those features to be in the model. Here's the benefit of our ranking algorithm. So rank feature based on their correlation with outcome. If a feature significantly correlates with previously ranked feature, it gets deprioritized, right? As I said earlier, even if it has high correlation with an outcome, right? The ranking is supervised, but without the computational burden of training. So here's an example. So we have feature three, which is highly correlated with feature one. 
the selection of one of them will be suppressed. The selection of the other as their core cross correlation is very 100% right. So the selection of one of the features will be suppressed than the other one because they are highly correlated. So both will give us the same answer or same benefit for a model. Now take an example two, right? Where feature three is correlated to feature one and two, right? But even the feature two was correlated, right? It will be like, you can have a feature second one gets deprioritized, right? Or the third one gets prioritized, right? Because of the high correlation, right? And then what happens is here's uh, an example. We chose a Boston data set where we had all the features, right? So the first experiment to demonstrate, we ran it with uh, no constraint, which, which means we don't care what features to include. We let the algorithm figure it out. So here's the ranking of the features we got, like you get the LSTAT, PT ratio, right? Rooms, CHS, right? These are the couple of features, right? But what we did in the next experiment, we choose text and index features to be included in the list because we are rank, going to rank them very high because we want them to be part of the model, right? And then you see the list on the bottom changes, but it doesn't change as much because if you see LSTAT, PT ratio, and RM was on the list, on the top list. Similar thing goes with the second experimentation where RM, LSTAT, and CH are still on the top of list. Plus the other two features gets included as well, right? And the others follows, right? And then what we did was, it was just an experiment ran on with, uh, to sample, to demonstrate with number of trees 20 and max depth five. So here's the simple graph to demonstrate, right? So if you see on the bottom left of your screen, this is the must include feature we started with. The R square is just about 0.4, right? On the left-hand side. And these are the number of features we included. So we, the default we start with number of features included is the first two features. And all of a sudden on the top, you see as soon as you get the four features into the model, right? You see an elbow there, right? And that's what helped us to detect, right? When we could stop, uh, doing more feature selection or we could, uh, we have reached the peak where we can get, that's the best R square for this model training we will get. We don't need to look into the other features set as needed, right? But if you see when we don't give any opinion, right, it starts with the R square of 0.6, but eventually it goes to 0.8, right? Or somewhere around that, right? Not more than that. So the more it's more the algorithm is trying to figure out and it's trying to do a feature selection and in, in an optimal way, right? And it's luckily it is it has a capability to include those features which we want. So here's the our approach, right? Uh, incremental training. We first sample the training data to a desired site size. After extracting the feature ranks, we start model training by one to n features in step of S feature for iteration, cross-validation for each model. At each step, the model accuracy is estimated. If S equals one, it means that all the features are gradually added one by one. A larger S means that the multiple rank features are added at each step, right? So we are trying to, uh, once we have ranked those features, we are trying to train the model with the ranked features and we have a capability in the algorithm to choose how many features you want to include and train the model to get the best model out of those ranked features. So the end result was that plot, which we already saw, right? And using the elbow detection, we find the optimal number of features to be selected for this model. As we saw, the number of features for the Boston data set was, we need to just select four features at the max to get the same accuracy. So it is uh, benefits of our approach is fast and scalable, quick feature ranking, no model training needed, right? We just need a correlation matrix, a linear model training steps for each uh, cross validation, right? We can manually select specific feature to be included if the modeling application requires them to, which is a very important thing for us, and select other features to complement them. Scalable implementation is Spark. Application on big sparse data sets successfully reduces our features 30% while maintaining the accuracy. Uh, so, that, so we can reduce our feature set by 33% while maintaining the same accuracy as we would have got with all those thousands of features in the model. Uh, here's our open source library. So we'll be open sourcing our uh, library thanks to Imran. He just really worked very hard up on uh, with us, right, to really help this, to make this thing happen. And so we decided to open this, uh, source this library, right? And then it is, in, it is app applicable and available both in Python and Scala. So here's the two methods you will see, no, uh, notice. So here's a simple API. First is the feature ranker. You pass in your data frame you pass your feature columns and then you get the output column and then you have to have a must include feature list you want to include. And then we have a feature selector uh, from the model, like figuring out from the rank feature, what are the best feature we could use to basically train the model finally. 
Uh, here you will see a feature inclusion increment, which is a very important parameter. So it was like, it allows you to do a jump, right? Whether you want to try each and every rank feature and then train the model to basically extract the best R square of the model or best fit, or you can do a set of model. Like I want to try from these rank features. I want to try three of them in an incremental of three. Uh, like the so first three will be included, then next three, then next three, and then it will figure out. And then you can obviously specify the train test split ratio, cross validation if you want to do an evaluation matrix. So you want to evaluate against R square or RMSE or MAE. I use a simple test uh, to test it using the Boston data set, right? So you see the first thing is to basically do the feature ranking. Once you have got the feature rank, you call the feature selector to gives you the scores back. So what are the best features to be included and the best scores for each feature it will uh, print it on the screen once you go through the example. So here's our library, it's hosted on the Clarify Health Spark Feature Selector. Uh, it has um, uh, adding other ranking, uh, our future goal is to basically add few more ranking algorithm to the library. Right now we just sort by the scores, but there are other ways to do it. We have to convert, as you saw, these are simple functions to, you just pass in the data frame and parameter. Our goal is to convert this thing into a pipeline transformer. So it can be incorporated in our AutoML pipeline. So it goes through the transformation phase, uh, phase right? The way we trans use the pipeline.transform API to seamlessly integrate into our system. So don't forget to rate this session. Thank you for listening to us. And uh, thank you, Imran. And thank you, everyone.